The only kind of leadership you really have is self-leadership. Right? Imagine you were a detective and you were investigating for a crime and you have a, like a prime suspect and they say, I didn't do it. And you go, cool, sounds legit. But no, you investigate, you ask questions, you try to figure out what's going on. You don't just take it for face value. But that's what we do. We take everything for face value. And most people who are in non-sales related positions don't understand the toll that that can take to constantly be hearing no all the time. Okay, let's speak about anxiety today. Every, every once a week or twice a week, I like to cry while I'm eating my food. This is a zombie apocalypse hot sauce. <laughs> You were kind of kidding around, but like, you know, you walk up to some immigrant parents, say you're anxious, they smack you in the back of the head and they say, get out of here, I, I'm cooking dinner, screw up. Jason Goldberg, once 130 pounds heavier and plagued by severe anxiety, now shines as a vibrant speaker and coach. His unique blend of humor and profound insights into mental performance and leadership has transformed lives. Tune in as Jason unravels the mysteries of anxiety, its roots and remedies, and shares powerful strategies for conquering it. Don't miss his life-changing advice. The amount of clients that I've talked to, grown people, very successful, who are still trying to get their mom and dad's approval by being successful. And I'm an old dog, I don't want to learn new tricks, which I don't think is the healthiest way to live, but whatever. Uh, at least do it for the next generation so they don't continue perpetuating the cycle of, of, of masking their feelings or pushing them down. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Over the last year, 86.6% of our regular viewers have not yet hit the subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It's a small gesture on your end and a huge leap forward for our channel. If you wouldn't mind, we would love to ask you if you found our channel informative and engaging, if you can please hit that subscription button. Your subscription means a lot to us. It allows us to go ahead and continue to put out great content, better guests, and as always, we will always put out two episodes per week. Thank you so much. Okay, let's speak about anxiety today. Uh, there is a horrible research that's been done that about 19.1% of US adults suffer from anxiety disorders. And what shocked me even more is that 39% uh, of children ages 10 to 19 are also experiencing disorder. So my question to you is, why do you think the numbers are so high and what can we do about it? Yeah, I mean, it's really the you know the kid one is obviously a lot more troubling, uh, and and I'm I'm sure you know social media has a lot to do with that. I'm not I'm not an old man, but we did not have social media when I was in high school, and I thank God every day for that uh, because it was it was tough enough being in high school without social. I can't imagine what it is now, but you know, anxiety at its core, at least in in my experience, is essentially the belief that there's some kind of future where I won't be okay, right. That, that's for me, that's how you can boil it down. Because if, if when I was born, my mother was given like this big scroll and the scroll showed all the different dates and times of when I was going to have the worst things happen to me, those things would still suck when they happened, but I would know I was going to be okay because then there's another one coming up six months later. Right. And so like, it would be okay. Even if there was a bunch of crap, I'd know it's not the end. And so, so I think that's a big part of anxiety is, is how can we shift from future focused, uh, uh, imaginative, uh, uh, scenarios that can be, I mean, we make up like blockbuster summer movies in our heads uh, about what can happen in the future. So how can we pull back from being so future focused and instead deal with what's in front of us now? And while also remembering that as humans, we're way better at dealing with crisis than we give ourselves credit for, right? I, there, I'm sure both of you and everybody listening to this has been through some kind of crisis and it doesn't matter what it is. We're not comparing crisis, but, but whatever crisis you've been through, if you're listening to this, you made it through. So you're, the proof that you have is that no matter what you've been through, you've gotten through. And that's how we know that because you're here right now. So, so in a nutshell, it's, yeah, how do we bring back the future focus anxiety, the future focus, you know, imagination back to the present moment and, and understand that the resourcefulness that we have is much higher than we probably give ourselves credit for. You know, there've been a nice discussion. Uh, I don't remember who was speaking about it, that 
how come kids, you know, they're playing so much games right now, the video games, and they fail in the games. But when they come into, you know, real life, they cannot basically deal with the failures. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and a lot of that I think has to do with, uh, can have to do with upbringing as well, right? And so the amount of clients that I talk to, I just I had one this morning that just is popping up right now. The amount of clients that I've talked to, grown people, very successful, who are still trying to get their mom and dad's approval by being successful. Like it's like 85% of the people I work with, right? And myself included, I've had that myself as well. My dad left before my mom, before my mom gave birth. When, as soon as she got pregnant, he left and never came back. And so I came into the world already with this deficit of somebody who contributed to making me didn't want me. So now I need to do something to prove what he missed out on. And that becomes a driving force. And it's not to say that it's, it's bad that it helps you get into motion, but it's not sustainable and it's not healthy long-term. And so I think one part of that is that, you know, there's way too much pressure being put on kids to perform at some high level. It's all comparison based. And then it feeds into the anxiety that they're never going to be able to do enough to satisfy their parents. Right. So that that's one big thing. But what you're talking about here that's really important is just is resilience. Right. Like, how do you bounce back from things? And that also is an upbringing thing. So if you're raised in a household where panic is the default it's very hard to expect that that same child is going to be able to be calm and, and have you know, equanimity in the, in the face of some massive challenge. And so we need to look at ourselves as adults and whether we have kids or we have you know, nieces and nephews or you know, whatever it is, with cousins who are young, whatever it is, we need to set the example that when bad things happen, first of all, we can't know if anything's bad and that's, that's a whole other conversation. But, but secondly is that it's going to be okay right? You're going to be okay, but you have to stick with this for a little while longer. And so I think that's, that's on us to be setting the example for kids of what resilience looks like. Jason, I, I, since you brought this up, I, re, I, I do want to ask you because it's, this is a great topic that we're talking about right now, which is so many of us uh, uh, are, tr are trying to achieve something to a level to get love from our parents or that one individual. Uh, and, and the same thing applies with me and it's driven me my entire life. And you are right. It's not healthy. So with that being said, what are some of the first things that let's just say, for example, somebody like me can do to kind of get away from that? Because I, 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 I suppose I no longer crave that, but I know that I'm not at a healthy level still yet. I still crave that attention. I'm still trying to say, Hey, if I achieve X, Y, and Z, well, my parents will love me even more because of my childhood. So, so what, what are those first couple of steps or what, can, what kind of actions can somebody take? Uh, let's just use me, for example, in this case, uh, to kind of try to shift away from that. But maybe it's a good thing that it drives you, no? Yeah, well, and that's the thing, right? It's like, it's not a, it's not a bad thing, but, but like we were just saying. I'll become lazy after, uh, after Jason fixes me right now. Uh, I'll just tell you, Vlad, you know what? I'm, I'm kind of feeling right. lazy right now. I don't want to focus anymore on growing the company. It's fine. <laughs> I, no, it's funny. I love that you said that because I was literally going there is that most people are afraid to challenge the belief that they need to make their parents happy or wh whatever it is because they're worried that without that motivation, who would they be? It's exactly what you said. And the amount of people that have told me that exact same thing, well, if I, if I stop using that as my motivator, I'm going to sit on the couch and watch Netflix and eat bonbons all day and my company goes right. to crap, right? And I, and I asked them, have you tested that? And 100% of the time, the answer is no. They've never mm -hmm. tested it. And, and one of my mentors, she says it beautifully, a woman by the name of Byron Katie, I think we may have talked to her about her briefly on, on the last time I was here. But she, she talks about this as well of people like, her whole thing is about questioning your beliefs, right? So a belief may be, um, I need to achieve in order to make my family happy, right? And the fact is that we never investigate our thoughts. Right. Imagine you were a detective and you were investigating for a crime and you have a, like a prime suspect and they say, I didn't do it. And you go, cool. Sounds legit. Like, no, you investigate, you ask questions, right. you try to figure out what's going on. You don't just take it for face value, but that's what we do. We take everything for face value. And so what she was talking about was, you know, a lot of people will say the same thing when you start to get into a place where you love what is right. Instead of always challenging what is No, this isn't enough. And I need more here and I need to do this. And that will be better over there than what I have here. And I'm constantly seeking and all those things. The, so the question is, well, if I stop doing that, then I won't be motivated. And she had this moment that she talks about where she was sitting on the couch and she had released herself of any of these external things. And she was sitting there. And then at some point she had to pee. And so she got up and went to the bathroom 
And, and, and it's, it's a funny anecdotal thing, but what she's trying to say there, I believe in the metaphor is you will be guided to do what needs to be done mm. when the obstacles are not in the way. She didn't sit on the couch saying, I'm going to have to pee one day. I just know it. And I got to make sure the bathroom is close enough. Maybe I shouldn't have that glass of water. She's just living life. And at some point her right. body told her, Hey, it's, it's time to go do your business. And she goes and does it. And so I think it, it the opposite can happen when you're not driven by these kind of uh, every everything that we're driven by is egotistical in some way. Even when you're being of service, mm -hmm. it's because you also love the way it feels to help other people, right? So there's right, ego right. in everything. It's not a bad thing. But when we are shifting that ego to being something that's not tied to like external validation or approval from from family, now we get to shift our narrative in a big way from what we're trying to avoid to what we're trying to create, right? So when I'm, when I'm motivated by doing something to make other people happy, I'm actually trying to avoid the feeling of being a disappointment. I'm trying to avoid the feeling that what I'm doing is not enough. I'm trying to avoid the feeling that I'm not going to make somebody happy, or I'm, I'm trying to avoid the feeling I'm going to make somebody upset, or I'm going to let them down. That's not playing to win. That's playing not to lose, right? Mm. And so when you shift that narrative from what am I trying to avoid to what do I try to create, that's a whole different story. And you'll probably do 90% of the same things you were doing when you were motivated by the unhealthy thing, but it'll be a healthy motivation now. Does mm, that make yeah. sense? Yeah. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide. If you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal, be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing. We cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade. Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. You know, when I was uh, thinking about the anxiety, I was curious if uh, there was any, you know, like research or statistics on how much people uh, would lose on salary because of the anxiety. And there been actually a study by Harvard School, uh, and they basically saying that there is a link between mental health uh, and economic productivity, and it's one trillion dollar link worldwide. I mean. So meaning yeah, by, yeah. and they're saying that by 2030, if the things goes as it goes right now, we're going to lose as a society 12 billion days of work. <laughs> we will be losing annually. So yeah. uh, in terms of the work perspective as an employee, what what's uh, your approach when you work with the clients? What do you think can be done if I'm uh, an employee and I have an anxiety and because of my anxiety, I'm losing my performance, my maybe my, I'm losing the opportunity to be raised to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a shame because it's, it's a systemic problem, right? We, we're, we're super, super short-term minded in, in the corporate world, quarterly earnings and whatever else. It's very, very short term. And yet we want longevity in the business, but we're sacrificing longevity in the business for the short term. And then we're going to run out of qualified people, healthy qualified people to do the work. And so we keep kind of punting, the thing down the field. Oh, you know, I'll deal with my employees' mental health later. But just this quarter, we really just got to push and make it happen. And guess what happens next quarter? Same damn thing. It, it never changes, right? So, so the employees are at a disadvantage, but that's not meant to be something from a victimization standpoint. This is not where you get to say, oh, well, my company doesn't care about me, so I guess I'm just going to have to be like this forever. You have a couple options. Number one, go find a job somewhere where there's a better culture, where they actually do care about that stuff, because it's very unlikely that you are going to change the culture from the inside out, if you're rank and file, hell, even if you're not rank and file, even if you're senior VP, if the company's big enough, that's like turning the Exxon Valdez, right? It's, it's, it's almost impossible to turn that at least quickly. So, so that, that's one thing is you could look for somewhere else to go. But the second thing is to recognize that the only kind of leadership you really have is self-leadership. And so if for whatever reason, there are no other jobs available, or let's say you're on the quest for another job, but it's taken a little while, so you kind of have to stay where you are right now, or you're choosing to stay where you are right now, then this is where we really want to do that work of investigating our thoughts and really challenging these things that are coming up as they're coming up and asking ourselves, you know, one of Byron Katie's questions, she says, is it true? Right. Looking at that belief. And so for me, I could look at the beliefs. I just gave a talk uh, in Mexico a couple of weeks ago and I was working with a sales team on this exact thing of how to kind of clear out the obstacles so they could be more motivated because, you know, in sales, I don't know if you guys have done, you know, sales directly before. I, th I think you probably have in some way, shape or form, but, you know, getting rejected, that takes a toll mm. on you and trying right. to break through a gatekeeper that takes a toll on you. And most people who are in non-sales related positions don't understand 
the toll that that can take to constantly be hearing no all the time. And so then that leads to being disheartened and being discouraged and thinking you're not enough and having anxiety and all these other things. So we need to really slow that down and check in with each one of those beliefs we're, we're holding on to and challenging those beliefs, right? And so, for example, you could say, uh, the, uh, you know what, the, you know, the, the, the market is flooded with competition, right? That, that's just what it is. I, I can't make sales because the market's flooded with competition. And that's kind of your death sentence. Where do you go from there? You're done. There's really nothing else to do. So you challenge that. You, you question it. You say, is it true that there's, the market is flooded with competition? And you sit with that for a minute and you really kind of meditate on it. And maybe your first thought when you meditate on it is, yeah, no, it, that's totally true. The market is 100% flooded with competition. You say, okay, cool. So you move on to the second question. Second question is, can I be absolutely certain that it's true that the market is flooded with competition? And for me, I've learned over the years, there's nothing I can be 100% certain of at all, period. And so when I'm being honest with myself, a little crack opens and I go, Mm, I, all right, I can't entirely know that the market's flooded with competition, but it still feels true, but I'm just going to say no for right now. And then I ask myself, how do I feel, right? How do I show up? How do I treat myself? How do I treat others when I'm at work and I believe the thought the market is flooded with competition? And I look inside, I go, well, um, I talk bad to myself. I put myself down. I, I snap at my fiance. Uh, I have no patience for people at work. I feel resentful towards clients or potential, potential clients who don't sign up with me. I see a competitor pop up and I just get so angry. How dare they do that? Like, that's how I feel. That's how I show up when I believe that thought. And then I say, cool, let's flip it around. And I say, who would I be without that thought? Sitting here about to make a prospecting call and it just doesn't even occur to me that the competition is, is the market is flooded with competition. What's different? How do I show up now? How do I talk to myself? How do I treat others? And when I sit with that one, I go, okay, well, if I'm sitting here with this thought, uh, sitting here doing my work and I don't have the thought, the market is flooded with competition, then I just make the call. And I just stop by my current client and make sure they're still happy. And I, I learn a little more about my industry so I can be even more of an expert when I go to the, to the next prospecting call. It shifts your entire narrative of, of what you do from that. And then the really cool thing is that you can then flip it around to try to find something that's even more true for you. Because this is the thing. You just have a belief that you've taken seriously, you're, you think is true. When we investigate, we say, oh, actually, that may not be true after all. There may be something that's just as true, if not more true. And so we went through this exact example with the sales team that I was talking about from a couple of weeks ago. And we said, OK, let's flip this around. Let's flip it around to the market is not flooded with competition. Now, this is not meant to be some like stupid mind trick where I go, hey, the market's not flooded with competition. Everything's great. Like, no, no, no. We're investigating that one too, right? And so I sat with them and this is a company that makes uh, medical grade uh, skincare, right? Like you can only get it through med spas and clinics and things like that. And so we flipped that around and I said, how could it be just as true, if not more true, that the market is not flooded with competition? And we had a little bit of open dialogue. And what we realized was this company that I was speaking to, they have such a level of care and concern for their clientele. They are so focused on innovating their product to make them healthier and more effective. They have the most amazing reputation in their industry for the products they put out. Is the market saturated with people doing that? No. There's a lot of Correct. skincare lines, Correct. but not a lot of skincare lines that care that much, innovate that much, and have that good of a reputation. And so I know that was kind of a long drawn out thing, but I, that, that's what we need to do to our thoughts. And instead of just saying, market's flooded with competition, well, that's true. I guess I'm screwed. Yeah. No, that's definitely great advice, actually. Uh, Jason, we're talking about anxiety and we talked about the rise of anxiety in uh, the United States, maybe even across the globe. Uh, but here's something interesting. Uh, so uh, pulled up some data before uh, a couple days before our discussion today. And this is a study done from the WHO. Uh, and I am not surprised at this at all. I just thought this was interesting. But richer countries uh, like Australia or New Zealand or other countries like the USA, usually have a significantly higher rates of anxiety disorders compared to poorer countries like Nigeria and China and Bangladesh. It's funny because growing up, or even if I go to my mom right now, and I'm sure it's people will laugh because they've all heard it, but if you come from an immigrant family and you tell your mom, hey, mom, hey, dad, I feel anxious, they don't even They'll understand. Like, what do you mean anxious? I, I work seven days a week with anxious. I, I don't even have time to be anxious. What, what is anxiousness? Yeah. So it, so. And perhaps it's not a fair question because, you know, we're not in, you're not an expert in anxiety. But this is this is very interesting. I guess my first question to you would be my parents and these immigrants. 
do they truly not understand what anxiety is or are they or do they have anxiety you think but they just it's they have so many other things going on that it's it it doesn't even come to the surface level so yeah. like that, that's my thought suppress over it here. and it comes yeah. to here's severe oppression yeah. of that or right like what what's going on here what, what, what are your thoughts on this I, I think it's i think it can be both but i, I think listen you know the fact that you you find the statistic about these you know richer countries having higher likelihood or higher uh, incidence of of anxiety speaks a lot to like maslow's hierarchy of needs right and it's like once you have your your security mm, and, and all correct. those things taken care of well then you have like you upgrade your problems right we 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 are problem resolvers as humans and so we will create problems where they don't exist just correct. so we have something to do with the mind right which is why we need like hobbies or something to stop doing that but but i would definitely say that because people in those richer countries countries typically have all their basic needs met and now they're in the kind of actualization stage well actualization if it's taken as a more entitled arrogant kind of thing it should mean how do i bring the best out of myself to be of most service to my community or most service of you know to the world that i live in but what it ends up being is you know how do i open up my third eye chakra uh because i feel like i'm not connected to mother nature and it's like that's adorable that's lovely and it's probably very important for a lot of people but people that are immigrants or, or who are still in developing nations they don't have time to think about that stuff. It's just not on their radar, right? So I think that's that's kind of the, the 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 baseline thing. But as far as immigrant parents, for example, not understanding or or things of that nature, I think you're totally right. One of them is that again, they just had so much going on, they didn't have time to worry about it. But I think there also is an element of oppression because yeah. you know the fact. And I know Vlad, you were kind of kidding around, but like you know, you walk up to some immigrant parents, say you're anxious, they smack you in the back of the head, and they say, "Get out of here! I, I'm cooking dinner. Get screw off!" You know. So, but that's kind of true, right? But they also had that done to them. Right. right. So at some point they Correct. were stressed out about something. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know how to deal with it. They didn't have a word for it, but they just said, mom or dad, I'm worried about whatever. And mom or dad did the same thing. Hey, get, get out of here. I, I'm, I'm doing something. Right. So I think there is a level of kind of pushing that stuff down. And, and I think everybody would do well to kind of look more at that stuff, if nothing else, so that you don't pass that down to the next generation. Right. If you're mm -hmm. okay with it and you're like, you know what, I'm an old dog. I don't want to learn new tricks, which I don't think is the healthiest way to live, but whatever, uh, at least do it for the next generation so they don't continue perpetuating this cycle of, of, of masking their feelings or pushing them down. Any advice on how, let's say, people like uh, my generation or even a uh, younger generation can communicate clearly to their parents about th their feel, you know, you have, let's say they have g uh, generalized anxiety disorder, but they're trying to get that message across to their immigrant mom, let's say, uh, but because either they've been repressed or they don't understand it because they've been working their entire life. Any, any advice for, for those people to clearly communicate, to try to get that other party to kind of understand what's going on uh, to maybe help the situation? Yeah, I mean, yes and no, right? So every, everybody's different and everybody's going to have their own level of understanding or openness to new things or, or whatever that is. So the two things I would say for this is number one, I have the saying I always say is don't go to your dry cleaner for accounting advice, right? Mm -hmm. So like the dry cleaner is amazing at dry cleaning my clothes. Right. I ask them to look at my P and L probably not the smartest thing in the world. Right. And vice versa. Right. I bring my, my dirty suit to my accountant. They're like, what the hell are you doing, man? I don't know what to do with this. So, so that's the first thing is like, if you really feel if you've tried and tried to communicate these things before and it's just met with complete resistance or they shut you down or whatever else, you just need to go get direct support yourself, right? Therapy, coaching, whatever it is, you just need to go for that on your own. And if you're super young, I would go to like, you know, counselors or people at your school and, and they have all kinds of resources now. So one good thing about kids having so much anxiety is that now at least schools are taking it more seriously and bringing in more resources to help them. So that that's the one good thing. But as far as having the conversation, let's say you haven't had the conversation before. It's not that you've tried and you keep getting shut down, but you just haven't even tried yet. The first thing to do, and this is such a good uh, perspective to have or a, a useful perspective to have, I should say, in any conversation is, is consent-based conversations, right? Mm. And you hear about consent-based conversations a lot in marketing or in sales, but in every conversation, I do this with my fiance as well, in every conversation there should be, there should be consent, especially if you're worried that you're not going to get the reception to what you're saying that you'd like. So what does that look like? I go to my, you know, let's say I go to my mom who immigrant parent who probably doesn't understand this. Maybe the word anxiety got mentioned at a party once and they were like, oh, that's stupid. These are kids just making it up. So maybe you have in your head like, eh, it's probably not going to go as well as I'd like. Then I start with consent and I say, hey, mom, there's something I've been dealing with lately that I'd like to talk to you about, but I'm not sure if it's something you'll be open to talking about. 
are you open to talking about something that may be a little different than what we normally talk about? And if they are already in resistance, I wouldn't even go any further, right? Because I didn't get consent. But if they're like, yeah, you know, of course, sweetie, like, you know, let, let's talk about the thing. Cool. Now you have an opening, right? They're open to it. And so you may need to, uh, so, so once you do that, you have consent. Then the key is maybe don't use words that would trigger them. So again, mm -hmm. if you know that your immigrant parents are triggered by the word anxiety because it's not what they came from, then describe your experience instead, right? I'm, I'm, I'm really stressing out, mom, because, you know, I, I really want to get into a good college next year and I'm studying so hard, but I just feel like I, I can never get caught up and I'm just worried I'm going to let you guys down, right? And just be vulnerable. And that's saying I have anxiety without saying I have anxiety. So, so that's kind of the thing, like, you know, consent-based and then using language that's about your experience instead of some medical label that is easier to shut down. I, I think also one of the main reasons why a lot of, I mean, youth and young generation even cannot speak with their parents because parents will judge them. Because kids yeah. feel it that they're being judged all the time if they're going to do the great job in school, great job at home, this and that. That's why they're not even bringing up these conversations. They are afraid that yeah. they're going to bring it up and parents will will think that they, they are failures or something, something is wrong with my kid or, you know, this is one of the main reasons, I think. And the parents... Yeah. Well, don't most of us judge? Do, yeah. Don't most of us judge others? Or what you're saying that you don't judge your kid? Maybe I'm judging, my, my, but my point is that the kids shouldn't know it. We shouldn't uh, show it to kids that we mm, that they are okay. being judged. If we want, you know, our kids later on in their life, if they have problem to come to us to speak. For me as a father myself, I mean, this is my one of the biggest fear that they will not come to me to speak about some problems. That's why I'm trying, right. you know, mm. every day telling them I love you, even you if you will fail at school, if you fail here, there, if you don't want to do, you know, schooling at all, and you just want to be laying in the bed all day long, still, I'm going to love you, you know, some, something like that. Unconditional love, basically. Yeah. 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 I love that. I, I think that's beautiful. I think that's... That, that, that is a beautiful example of, of parenting without, with love and without pressure, right? Because right? there, there, is, there is productive pressure that we can put on ourselves and, and our children and whoever else that, you know, we, we are with. Uh, but there's a level where that becomes totally unhealthy. Now, when it comes to the judging piece, yes, we're, we all judge. Like everybody judges everything. And, and judgment is great. Judgment is how I don't get hit by a car when I walk outside because right. I can judge the distance of how far away the bus is or whatever, right? But, but there is something to be said here where, and this, it's a tall, it's a big ask for, for kids, but I think once a kid is in their teens, they can do what I'm about to say, is we need to realize that any judgment we get from a parent or anybody else actually has nothing to do with us. I mean, it right. looks like it does. And, and I know we talked a little bit about that last time with like kids picking on each other, but, but the same thing happens with adults. And so if, if, if I had a, a parent who came down on me and was judging me, let's say I came and said, oh, you know, I'm really struggling in math. And they go, well, you better freaking figure it out because if you don't get into a good school, da, 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 and they start doing all these things and the kid walks away like, oh man, geez, I, I feel even worse now than before I talked to my parent. If they were then able to have that parent's parent come and whisper in their ear and say, hey, just so you know, I did the same thing to your dad. I just thought it was the only way I could motivate him. And I really wanted right. him to do well. And I was so scared because I had seen one of my friend's kids that dropped out of school and then ended up being on drugs. And I just, I wanted the best for him. And so maybe it wasn't the best way to do it, but that's all I knew how to do. And if you knew that as the kid, then you look at your parent and you go, oh, okay. Well, he's just he's just worried that something bad's going to happen to me, and it's not a very healthy way to do it. But at least I get where it's coming from, and then I don't take it as personally. Like I said, tall ask for adults, let alone kids. But right. I think the more we can get uh, you know younger people into understanding, hey, there's something behind the words that are being said, and it probably has nothing to actually do with you. I think that can help a lot with just receiving that kind of judgment. Yeah, we should stop take everything mm -hmm. personally, even adults. Hundred percent. 100 yeah, that, that would be great we'd yeah. live in a much better oh, society yeah. jason you know what was giving me anxiety last night tell me i don't know if you can see this but this is a zombie apocalypse hot sauce so <laughs> i am a hot sauce connoisseur i haven't tried this one exactly yet are you familiar with the hot hot ones of course uh, i was about to so ask you if you YouTube. watch it of yeah course. well yeah, yeah, yeah this is one of their featured ones but <laughs> so awesome. you know every every once a week or twice a week I like to cry while I'm eating my food. So <laughs> I would take it. I think I would be joining the apocalypse. 
<laughs> no, Vlad would be on the floor. Vlad cries when you put some black pepper on his food because it's too spicy for him. Dude, I, I can't, I can't um, do it either, man. I, I, I would love to say I can do spicy food. I, I just can't. I could when I was younger. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> well, I need to cry at least twice a week with my food. So Good. it tastes great. But here's the problem. The problem is at the nighttime, it becomes pretty bad because you start experiencing heartburn. You know, <sighs> So you yeah. wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning. You're like, damn. You know, why did I eat that? Yep. And so, you know, I have to go ahead and, you know, take a take one or two Tums. Now, I know that you are actually, you started a company. And so I kind of want to talk about this. It's called Kiss My Acid Goodbye. And so this is fantastic because I resonated with it right away, related with it right away. So I kind of want to know and understand a little bit more. Is, 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 that, is that the better version than Tums, a healthier alternative? What is that? And is that going to help me when I actually open up this apocalypse sauce and douse it, you know, maybe in about two or three days. Nice yeah, no, teams are actually, as well. yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. yeah, it's so, so funny. When you said it just now, there was a little bit of a, of a, of a delay in the internet. And so it cut off in the middle of the word acid, uh, which I won't repeat it, but it was very funny for that moment. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, so I've struggled with acid reflux for the last 12 plus years. I had bariatric weight loss surgery, which again, I think we talked about last time. Uh, and, and one of the side effects of the surgery for me was this just terrible GERD, uh, uh, hmm. which is the disease, the, the actual affliction, but it's heartburn and acid reflux. And so I have been on for, for 12 years now twice a day h2 blockers which are like over the counter like the prilosec nexium those kind of things yeah uh, and then tums in between just as needed at night especially middle of the night when i wake up all those things and so i was doing i, I was looking to start my my next company and i really wanted it to be a product-based company the last three businesses i've started all service-based and i really wanted just you know it's there's something about having something in your hands right building yeah, something yeah. with your hands i wanted to feel like a man for once okay uh so uh, so i'm like i'm gonna i'm gonna build a product and so i asked myself the question like what's what is the problem I would like to dedicate the next five to 10 years of my life to, right? That I would be really proud to say, this is the thing I'm working on. And I looked internally at myself first, because that's always the easiest. And this is the thing that came to me. And so I started doing research about all this stuff. And man, I did not realize how much damage can be done to our systems by taking these over-the-counter acid reducers, the Tums, that like all, you know, it's not just Tums. I don't mean to pick on Tums, but any, any of these companies that, that do this thing, this kind of thing, it is actually making things worse to the point where, and I don't just mean worse as in more reflux or more heartburn, which is also true, but it actually uh, prevents us from uh, absorbing the vitamins that we need from our food. It prevents the food from breaking down. Uh, it creates, uh, uh, it could potentially create gastritis or it can uh, uh, take away the esophageal lining and then you can, there's potential wow. for even like cancer risks in that place. There's all these different things that happen as a result of taking these medications and these over-the-counter things. And so I started researching it, really diving in deep. And I'm, I'm the type that when I get onto something, I just like, I'm like a dog with a bone. Like I just immerse and start reading hundreds and hundreds of pages of medical journals and decided I wanted to create a product that would be a gut health product first to restore your gut health that gets all messed mm. up from all the crap that we're eating all the time. Uh, and, and even antibiotics and all this other stuff that really messes with our stomach and stress and anxiety, which is a massive trigger for acid reflux, by the way. And I want to do that while also relieving the symptoms. So I didn't want to make another Tums because Tums and all these other things, they do one thing. They neutralize, suppress, or, or just in some way reduce the, the amount of acid in your right. stomach. And people think the reason you have acid reflux is because you have too much acid in your stomach. It's actually not the case at all. The reason we have acid okay. reflux is there's this little thing here, and I'm going to laugh because I laugh every time I say it. It's called the lower esophageal sphincter. And this, this lower esophageal, see, you're both smiling too, you 12-year-old boys. And so there's this, this thing here at the bottom of the throat, and it opens up. The muscle kind of opens up when you eat to drop the food down, and then it closes again. And then all the acid stuff happens in your stomach. And then there's another sphincter that releases the food into the small intestine when you're done, right? The problem is that over time, depending on a lot of different things, that sphincter up top here gets a little weak. And so when it mm -hmm. closes, it kind of closes, but not all the way. And so now when all the acid stuff's happening and it splashes back up, instead of getting hit by a wall, it goes up through the middle of this thing. And then we feel all this burning sensation. And so what I've put together is this all natural product. It's a powder based product. Uh, you just mix in a little bit of water and drink it. And not only does it relieve your, your reflux symptoms, it actually will coat your throat to make sure it's being protected from any acid that does come back up. And then it actually restores the gut microbiome. It restores the mucosal lining of the stomach. It gets everything back in play so that when you're eating, your food can be digested well. It can be passed on to the small intestine well. It's not sitting in there creating more pressure to push up against the throat again. Like it's really going to the root cause of what's going on instead of just looking at symptoms. Wow. Well, I'm excited to try it because I will definitely, I, I know it's on pre-order right now, so I will, I will try it out. 
uh, Thank you, for man. sure. Uh, now, I know earlier on we were talking about how you were talking to the, the sales team. And so in that scenario, let's uh, I kind of want to bring it back to you now. Yeah. To, so how do you feel? And as I know I'm shifting a little bit. We'll go back into anxiety questions in just a second. But so launching a product, let's talk a little bit about the entrepreneurship aspect. How do you feel the market? There are a lot of products. It's very competitive. What are your thoughts? Do you feel anxiety as you launch this product? Yeah. Do you feel anxiety? <laughs> yeah. Of course I do. That it's the human condition. I mean, anxiety is something that just comes up. So 100%. I do. And then I just have to navigate it using all the same stuff we talked about here. But I am by no mm. means immune whatsoever. And, and, and my view on, on products you know, that, uh, or on, on the business landscape in general is that you know, tailoring things to people and making people feel like it's really for them is kind of the only way to differentiate yourself nowadays, right? It's really brand over anything else because plenty of people do the exact same thing, but we're all called to certain brands that we go back to over and over, Correct. Again, whether it's because of their story or because of you know sustainability practices or because the CEO went to the same college you went to, whatever it is, there's some kind of connection, right? And so my whole thing is how can I bring myself, who I am naturally, into this business so that if people are looking at seven different products who all kind of claim to do the same thing, that there it's a no brainer that they would want to pick mine out of those seven. So it doesn't mean I have to be the best, although I'm obsessed with product and I want to be the best, but it doesn't mean I have to be the best. It does mean that I have to be the most in tune with the people that I want to serve the most, right? And really know how, how, to, how to be with them and know how to create community. So to me, and this is a big part of what I talked about it in Mexico as well, is you need to have in business to me, at least you need to have context and community. Those are the two mm -hmm. things you have to have in order to really Correct. build a business. And what I mean by context is understanding what business you're in, right? So even these med spa clinic people that I was talking to, they're not in the med spa business. They're in the self-confidence business disguised as a med spa business. And they have to know that because if you don't know that, you're not going to know how to speak to your people. If you're speaking the language right. of med spa instead of speaking the language of self-confidence or self-love, you're missing the mark. Once you have your context, then it's about community. How do you create community? And it's not even necessarily community around your product. It's community as in tapping into what people already love and letting your product be a backdrop for that. Mm. Massively powerful example, KitKat. When Nestle wanted to expand KitKat into Japan, they knew they couldn't do the same things they were doing in the US and UK. They're smart enough to realize they can't just throw a bunch of marketing dollars. So they did some research on Japanese customs. And one of the things they found was that gift giving, people giving gifts to each other is huge in Japan. Very collectivist culture, like they love giving gifts to each other. And so they started, they, they realized that KitKat uh, translated into Japanese sounds like kitokatsu. And kitokatsu sounds very close to a phrase that's very popular in Japan, kitukatsu. And that means you will absolutely be successful or you will certainly mm. win, like something like that. And so yeah. now all of a sudden, Kit Kats started becoming a gift that people would give to other people before they took exams or big tests. Wow. And now okay. one in three test takers in Japan is given a Kit Kat before they take wow. the test. Right. So KitKat didn't say, hey, look at us. We're the best. They just said, hey, you guys love giving gifts and you love wishing people luck. Here's a great way to do that. And they create a community around it. And so I'm doing those exact same things for me as well. I am not in the acid reflux business. I am in the get your quality of life back and stop suffering every time you eat the foods you love business. Right. Because right. that's what's actually affecting people. And then from a community standpoint, I am grassroots, man. I think there is there is way too much automation and not enough intimacy. And I like combining mm -hmm. the two together whenever possible. But like for me, for example, we have a bunch of pre-orders that have been coming in since we started the pre-orders. Every single person that pre-orders, I send them a Loom video to thank them, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your trust. Thank you for getting in so early on this. I know I haven't even put much out about the product yet. I don't take that trust lightly. And please know I'm going to keep you updated on things. If you have any questions, let me know. When people are sending me questions about the product, I'm sending Loom videos back to them. Like anything you can do to create intimacy with people automatically takes your brand to the next level. And they're going to tell everybody about the brand because nobody expects this. The amount of messages I've gotten back saying, Wait, you sent me a video like, like it's for awesome. me, my name in it. Like that's I yeah. I love that. That is so. It's so funny that you mentioned that because that's exactly what we do here. Uh, we and we use Loom exactly, yeah. and the amount of messages that we get back from customers because they never expect a video response or a video walkthrough. It's you know, it's always a text, and it's like, oh my god, I can't believe you you made this video. Thank you so much. And it, it's just so much nicer and pleasant. So, and that is definitely a way to differentiate yourself and, and grow with via grassroots efforts. Uh, it's 100%. that is an amazing tactic. Yeah. Uh, so congrats again on Thank the you. launch or pre launch. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm going to place the order because I, I need it because uh, I'm 
I'm I'm done with Tums. I need to I need to go on to your brand. But to be fair, I only use Tums like maybe once a month uh, because I've been leading off the hot sauce. Uh, you know, I've been trying to because as man, H catches up to you really quickly. I used to <laughs> see. I even don't know what Tums is because I don't eat spicy. <laughs> Well, that's not the only cause. There it's are the other causes, yeah, but, yeah. but hot sauce is probably definitely a big one. <laughs> How many tries and fails did you did you do before you finalized the formula? This is uh, it took us ten formula, ten ten iterations 10 of the formula. formula. Yeah, and and so and that's the other thing too about building a brand is documenting the journey as well, right? That's a big thing. People love to see. You know, people are are much more concerned nowadays where something comes from than what it is. Right. And that's where does it come from, meaning ingredients and everything else, but also like who was the person that created it? What's the story right. of the person that built it? Because that builds more trust. It builds more intimacy. So, yeah, so 10 versions. And, and I was very I was very upfront, like when I was filming videos of myself trying the, the early ones. And I was like, huh, that has way too much stevia and leaves a disgusting aftertaste in your mouth. Like mm. I'm, I'm saying it on camera because that's part of the journey. And so then it became like, oh, we need to make this flavor way better without putting a bunch of artificial crap in it. So I think that's a big part of it too. But yeah, 10, 10 iterations. Wow. Okay. Well, I'll let's, uh, let's go back to our anxiety topic. And now I want to touch upon uh, teachers because we have a lot of audience who are teachers uh, listening and watching us. So I want to bring a scenario, for example. So a teacher, a yeah. class of 30 students, and this is this is actually, 30 students is actually a good case scenario because I've been going to schools recently uh, for the tours and 30 students, act, I mean, I didn't realize, but this is a good scenario when you have only 30 kids. It's more. It's more. Yeah, yeah. in some, school, some schools, they have 38, 40 kids in one class and it's uh, one main teacher and one assistant. Not, hmm. can you imagine? This is... Oh, it's, that's crazy, man. You might as well be in college in that general assembly classes with like 500 students at that point. Just put, just, just put 500 students in one. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's 40 right. teachers to one. It's, that's crazy. Yeah. So that's imagine the, the situation and um, some of the students is having, let's say, an anxiety attack during the class or pre when they're presenting or speaking in front of the class. So... In this case, what teacher can do to alleviate, you know, the stress, the anxiety at, at, the, at this point, at this exact moment? And, and you're talking about when they go up uh, to, to speak in front of yeah. the class that they have this kind mm -hmm. of feeling. Yeah. Now, ha has this happened before or this has completely just happened out of nowhere? They never even knew this kid had any anxieties at all. Let's consider the when it's first time it's happening. So, so what I would want to do is I would want to be really flexible on the delivery method. Okay. Cause what I don't want to say is, Oh, you're feeling anxiety. Just go ahead and sit down and don't do the thing. Cause now mm -hmm. we're not teaching resilience. We're not teaching any, mm -hmm. any skills. Now, if it's a really bad, like panic attack, then I want to say, Hey, you know, do you mind if I take you outside? We'll chat for a second and just take them out of the class and, and just soothe them. Right. That's not the time to push them. But if it's just a thing where they're like, just really nervous and it's, it's hard, you're in front of the class and you're worried about people judging you and everything else then I want to be flexible on the delivery. And what I mean by that is if I notice a kid having that kind of anxiety in the moment uh, about speaking, I want to change it from presentation to conversation, right? And as the teacher, I want to say, hey, you know what, in instead of doing what you were going to do, right. you mind if I just ask you some questions about this? Because being in conversation with somebody is much different than just staring at a sea of faces, some of which are on their phone, some of which are probably picking their nose or doing whatever. But if I just turn to the teacher and the teacher says, hey, so, you know, tell me a little about this. Oh, okay. And what did you find when you look this up? And you'll see their nerves start dropping. And then maybe the next time they come up, now that they've had this experience of being up in front of the class is not terminal. I'm not going to die from it. They may, it may be a little easier for them to just speak directly to the class. Do you think in general, is it a good idea to put stress on kids to train their anxiety and the stress resistance? I think it depends, right? So so if you look at the science of flow, for example, right, and, and everybody, well, a lot of people want to be in flow, right, because it's become such a big thing. It's in the zone or what, you know, whatever you would call that. They actually have a mathematic equation, funny enough, about this, that in order for you to be in a flow state, whatever the task is that you're doing shouldn't be more than about 4% beyond your current capabilities. Mm. Okay. So if, if, the, if the thing you're trying to do feels like it's 50% more than what you've ever done and what you know how to do, you are going to be so overwhelmed with anxiety and, and fear, anticipatory anxiety and fear about everything going on, you're probably not going to do anything. And on the flip side, and we've experienced this too, all of us have experienced this too, if the challenge that you're taking on is less than what your skill set is, you're just bored. 
and you don't mm. want to do it anyways, right? So they kind of found this little 4% sweet spot. So, so the answer is it depends how far we're trying to stretch the kids. And so, and it needs to be individual, which is why having 40 right. people in the class is just insane, but you know, they do what they do and God bless all of you teachers. Cause I know what I was as a teenager and I would never wish that on anybody. Uh, but, but I think it does have to be something where it has to be a little more tailored where I look at kind of what that kid does. And if it's somebody who never, ever speaks up in class, putting them in the front of the room way more than 4% beyond what they've done. Right. But having them, uh, but talking to them outside and saying, Hey, I would love for you to share your thoughts on X, Y, Z. When we talk about that in the class today, are you okay with that? Like from your seat, you don't have to come up or anything. Would you be okay answering a question about that? And they say, yes, to me, that's more in the 4% range, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to be kind of aware of how far we're stretching people in order for them to grow. That's really good advice. And it's good, great advice for teachers as well. I, I, since we're talking about teachers, I have one more question related to uh, uh, our audience, which because we we work with a lot of teachers uh, nationwide, uh, and so it, it's and I'm sure you you would not be surprised, but over the past few years, uh, the, the stats for teacher anxiety have skyrocketed in the classroom. Obviously, there's a lot more uh, student uh, misbehavior. Uh, there's a lot more also violence. Uh, teacher safety is on the line as well. We've seen articles and videos and just, you know, state of social media. Yeah. So, you know, TikTok amplifies everything as well. Uh, and so I, we see a lot of teachers that are currently stressed out. What, what, what's some, what advice would you offer them at this state? Because obviously, you know, teachers, they love their professions and they still want to pursue this field, but are there any practical advice or tips you can give them for those teachers who are frustrated right now within the, like kind of, it is what it is, right? That you really can't fix it in right this second. So any practical tips or advice that can help the mental health space of teachers and educators? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach. So I think one of them is is to make sure. I know this is this sounds cliche, but there, there's a reason it's cliche because it's true. Uh, is that we have to be taking care of ourselves outside of school, right? We really and I know it's it's hard. It's like a luxury. What do you mean? I have kids at school, and then I have kids at home, and I have a spouse, and I have and I have all the things. None of that's worth anything if you're in a hospital bed, right? right. It, it just doesn't matter. And so so we need to kind of uh, in some ways we're talking about anxiety bringing the future back to the present, we kind of want to do the opposite here and kind of look at the time horizon of what we're doing. We say, you know what, being this stressed out, sure, it could probably work for a couple months, a couple of years, maybe even a couple of decades. Then what? Right. Then what mm -hmm. happens? And am I, am I trading on future misery by not taking care of myself now? Right. So that, that's a big one that, that needs to happen. The second thing though, more for kind of in the moment, especially if you're like in class and you're getting really anxious or whatever it is, and, and maybe you have, you know, a little bit of a break, five minutes, hopefully between classes, is it's really important to look at what we are making the center of our universe, right? What we're making the most important thing in our world. Because my belief is that whatever you make the center of your universe, you're going to use all of your energy to protect it from failing or falling apart, right? Relationship, uh, job, health, whatever it is, if, if it's the most important thing in the world, all your energy goes there and it's not necessarily healthy energy that goes there. And so I don't want to make anything out there my, the center of my universe. If there's anything I'm going to make the center of my universe, it's going to be my own peace and ease, mm. right? That's it. And, and when I shared that, uh, I shared that recently on a, a, a leadership conference and one of the, the women at the end raised her hand and said, okay, so I don't make any of those things the center of my universe. And then my payroll doesn't get paid and my business doesn't grow and my kids don't get you know, fed and all these different things. That's what's going to happen. And I said, okay, I mean, that's, that's one option, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but, but there's the, the other option I would, I, would, I would say is, listen, if I have payroll to be made and I have a business that needs my attention and I have kids that need to be fed, me not doing those things does not contribute to my sense of peace and ease. Mm -hmm. So if I'm starting with the only thing that matters is my own peace and ease, then I do what needs to be done so I can maintain my peace and ease. So it's not that you say, I'm abdicating responsibility. I'm not doing anything in the world anymore. I'm going to become a hermit in retreat. It's you shifting that narrative. And so I will, I'll have my clients do this and I, I do it for myself all the time. I'll close my eyes and ask myself, what am I making the center of my universe right now? Right. And it could be on this product launch. I could say, I could be really stressed out and say, oh, 
what I'm making the center of my universe is getting people to sign up for the email list. And like, oh, there's not as many people signing up as I want. And so now I'm stressed out and maybe this is the wrong strategy. Maybe I should do this. And my mind just starts going nuts and nothing good happens. So I ask myself that question, what am I making the center of my universe? And I go, okay, it's, it's getting signups on the, on the list. Cool. What would it feel like right here, right now, just for the next 30 seconds or so, if the only thing that was my center of my universe was my own peace? Just right now. And I close my eyes and say, if the only thing I cared about right now was my sense of peace, what would be different in my body, in my breathing, in my thoughts? And I noticed that like my shoulders drop and they're like not so tense anymore. I noticed I was holding, you know, the tension in my shoulders. And then I noticed that maybe my breathing gets a little slower, a little deeper. And I may notice that the thoughts in my head start slowing down a little bit. They're still there. They're still nagging thoughts, but they're a little bit slower than they were before. And when I do that, if I'm able to regulate my nervous system, even by five or 10% that way, and then go back into the classroom, it's a different experience. Mm. Yeah. No, I wish in school they, they would advice. create like a meditation rooms or something like that for teachers to go, Yeah. Yeah. you know, be, be, before the class starts, before the day starts, they just go and do the uh, collective meditation altogether. I think it would really 100%. alleviate a lot of stress and anxiety from teachers. I agree with that. I, I think I think they really should, and I think that the I think schools at their own peril. And and I understand there's budget constraints and everything else, but there are so many meditation teachers, at least in this country. I won't speak for everywhere, although they're pretty common in Europe and a lot of other uh, nations. But but there are so many meditation teachers in this country that any school I can almost guarantee you could find a meditation teacher who would mm-hmm. love to come in once a week and just do a session for the teachers and not even charge. If I was a meditation teacher and that was my business, I would gladly go in once a week and do a one hour session with them and teach them how to meditate. That's not the only time they should meditate in the week, but at least to teach them how to do it on their own so they can do it for the rest of the week. And so I think schools not realizing that that's as much as a technological innovation as new computers and new iPads, they're doing themselves a disservice. Don't be too optimistic, Vlad. I was saying New York City just cut uh, funding with the DOE by, uh, I forget exactly what the number, but we've experienced budgets. I mean, it's the Department of Education. What do you expect? (laughs) All right. uh, We have to be optimistic, though. At least uh, some private schools and some charter schools, they have, you know different situation no i mean listen it, it's a it what, what you suggested is a very low lift in reality it's simply a one small room or you know one it what it only takes is one person to really care about it and i think they can right. already organize it as jason said there are a lot of meditation meditation teachers who can do it for even for free you just need to go and look for them and 100 percent next block somebody will be able to do it yeah, you can't throw a quarter in Los Angeles without hitting a meditation teacher. I'm not sure how it is everywhere else, but you know, <laughs> yeah, we'll ship some to you in Arizona, Vlad, if you need oh, them. No we problem. got plenty of them here. Yeah. I can teach you in meditation myself. <laughs> Maybe we can pilot it in New York City schools. Yeah, nice we'll idea. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, yeah. I, I got, I got, I got, I got a great guy for you for that, by the way, who could, who would probably love to partner with. Yeah. That'd be awesome. He was a Dude. former head strength trainer for the Knicks, and now he's gone off wow. on his own and he's teaching meditation and doing really amazing things. Wow, that would be incredible. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll definitely talk more about that. Now, uh, Jason, I only have one question, one last question to ask you on my end. I kind of want to talk about silencing our inner critic. And mm-hmm. I know we touched a little bit about this, something that we think about, but it's really hard to kind of really silence it. So I'm referring to obviously the negative self-talk that many of us experience from time to time. And some that face on a daily basis. This is obviously when our inner critics uh, tell us that we're not good enough. Now, studies show that women actually, women experience this uh, far more than men, thinking that they're not enough, not a good wife, not a good mother, not a good employee. How can we stop this inner critic? So same thing here. Sometimes I'll find myself, you know, always criticizing myself. Doesn't happen often, but it happens. But I, you know, how do I, so, okay. So let's not take me as an example, because I guess that's, I guess that's normal, but for somebody that's happening pretty often, several times a week, what can we do? What can we practice? So this, this happens less and less. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll tell you from me, somebody who sometimes has that happen multiple times a day, forget multiple times Mm -hmm. a week, uh, is it's, it's interesting. There's such a, and this goes back to some of the things we've been talking about through this conversation. We have such a culture of doing here. Right. And, and again, in a lot of countries around the world, but, but in the U S we have a, a big culture of doing and 
while that's great and things need to get done, we have now taken personal responsibility for things that we don't need to take personal responsibility for. And so I think that when a thought pops in my head, I own it. It is my thought, right? And investigating those thoughts when they pop up, that's great, but that's not taking ownership. That's investigating in the same way, like I said before, a detective would investigate a crime. They don't become the crime. They investigate the crime with some distance. And so what I'm pointing at here is that sometimes there's nothing to do because we have gotten into this place where we have confused the presence of a thought with the presence of a threat, right? Correct. And Correct. it's not a threat. It feels like a threat, right? That's where anxiety comes from as well. It feels like a threat, but it's just a thought. And so for me, one of my practices is, can I just witness this thing as if it's any other experience I could possibly have in the world, right? So when I look at the entirety of the experiences that I can have in the world, one of those experiences wearing a black shirt, one of those experiences is talking to you guys, one of those experiences owning a water bottle, like they're all just experiences. So why does negative self-talk as an experience hold more weight than me owning a water bottle? Why are they not the same thing? So you didn't ask me the question, hey, what do we do about water bottles? You know, when you own a water bottle, like how do you, how do you navigate that? Like people don't ask that because they don't give as much weight to that thing. So the first, the first thing to do here is to see if maybe you can just be with the thing instead of trying to fix it, instead of trying to silence it, instead of trying to have it go away. What if you could welcome it in? What if you could say like, yeah, hey, come on in. Stay as long as you want. I'm not afraid of you. I'm just going to witness you right? You're just out here being witnessed. And so there's these two questions that I love to ask myself when I get into this crap, like, you know, the crap storm. The first question is very simple. How do you, how do I feel? Right. I'll say, oh, I feel stressed. I feel anxious. I feel whatever. Right. Or I feel like I'm not good enough or whatever the self-talk is. Cool. Second question is how do I feel about how I feel? Because that's the one where we get in trouble. Mm. Because if the answer to that one is, well, I shouldn't feel that way. I should feel like I'm enough. People should make me feel like I'm enough. Why don't people validate me enough? That's the reason we're upset. Not because we feel like we're not enough. It's because we're taking way too seriously the feeling that's present that we have enough and we're taking it as fact. And so that's the first thing is like, can I just witness this? Can I say, you know, uh, peanut butter, uh, a cardboard box, anxiety. Can I process those all the same way? Witness them all the same way. And I know that feels like a massively tall order when it's something that you've never done before, but just start getting this place like, okay, cool. I literally see this thing in front of me. Like I'm going to take it out of my head and, and hold it in my hand. And I say, that is anxiety. Cool. It's not who I am. It's present in my thinking, but it's not who I am. And the more I can have that separation between who I am and what I'm thinking, the less I feel the need to silence what's going on in my head because it's not a threat anymore. Yeah. Love Does that, that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Is there any connection between Flat anxiety off. and the food that we eat? Oh, I mean, dude, the, the, the gut mind connection is insane. I mean, it's, it's a lot of what I've been researching now with the new product. And, you know, we have this enteric nervous system. I don't know if you guys know about this, but it has a trillion nerves in our stomach. It's a second brain. And so wow. there is a direct connection. There's a thing called the vagus nerve that travels all the way from the top of the head all the way down and, and through the stomach as well. And, and the, the amount of, uh, they actually saw, and this is, this is kind of gross, but it's kind of cool too. You guys will appreciate this. There was somebody who, and I don't remember when this was, it was probably you know, 50 years ago or something. Somebody who had some kind of, they got shot or something during war or, or something happened. And the only way they could help this person was they had to kind of sew them up in a way where they were still direct access inside their chest cavity right? They couldn't, they couldn't cover it up for whatever reason. Maybe the skin graphing technology wasn't what it is today, whatever it is. And so this one doctor brought this guy on and wanted to do research about the connection between the gut and the mind. And what he noticed was he actually was able to, this is going to sound disgusting. He was able to lower food directly into the stomach cavity, right? As this person was just sitting there and feeling fine and watch how the stomach acids did their thing and break down the food. Then they purposely put him in an agitated state and put food in again, and watched how the stomach was just resisting it and fighting against it. And all these wow. things were happening. And it was the same kind of food. Wow. The only difference was that he was in an agitated state. So yes, the foods that we eat, the way we can manage our stress and anxiety, it's a massive thing to the point where it's one of the things I'm doing with my product that separates us from everybody else is that people that buy the product on subscription, they get access to a monthly live group coaching call with me. Because if mm -hmm. we're not looking at the inside stuff that could also be causing the reflux, we're only looking at half the problem. So yeah, Vlad, you're hundred percent on point that there's a direct connection. I'm done with the questions about the anxiety and all the stuff. I have actually one last question that I just came up with. Uh, I think we're going to make it as a tradition at the end of each uh, uh, episode. 
which question would you cool. like to answer at the beginning of the next uh, interview? With, I mean, our next guest, which question they should answer? Yeah, wow, cool. that's, that's, that's really cool. I like that. Um, that's really good. I, the, the first thing that pops in my head, it, it may seem about a bit cliche, but I, I really like this, is like what's, I, I, I would normally say this with a curse word. I don't want to curse on the show, so I'll, I'll do an abbreviation. But I would love to know what is a moment in their life that started off as an F you moment and now it's a thank you moment. Hmm. Like I, I love hearing stories of like this thing I thought was going to be the end of me and here's why it was actually the best thing that could have ever happened to me. I love that. Jason, thank you so much. We will ask that question to our next guest. Jason, please let us know what you have going on uh, to our audience, to our guests, where they can follow you, anything cool, any exciting news. I know we, we've talked about it, super exciting news, but please. Yeah, and I'm engaged also, but that has nothing to do with my work, but I'm, I'm still very <laughs> excited about that. Uh, so yeah, the two main places I hang out, I mean, it's, it's all on Instagram, but if you want to look at more of the personal growth kind of stuff that we've been talking about here, uh, the Jason Goldberg, the Jason Goldberg on Instagram, oh, that sounds terrible. Uh, and then uh, and then also kiss my ass at goodbye uh, is, the, is the Instagram handle as well. If you want to follow that journey and if you have reflux and you want to get more information and education there, that's where you can find me there. Jason, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you again. Love talking can't to you guys. Wait to talk, uh, can't wait to reconnect once again. Thank you Same, so much. Man. Thanks, guys.